Yeah, the whole history of One Dark Night actually started with me in the catacombs in Paris in, I guess that was like 1970. And uh, going down there with a candle, as they did in those days on the tour, everybody got a candle. I broke away from the tour group and walked through these corridors with nothing but skulls and bones from centuries of, of uh, cemeteries. And for the first time in my life, I actually had like a, a supernatural fear, you know, felt that, you know, hairs on the back of your neck sticking up kind of, kind of scare. <laughs> and that feeling stuck with me. And when I came back to the States and being a huge horror fan, uh, along with my friend Mike Haas, we said, you know, let's see if the, we can do something with that idea. And the notion of a mausoleum, you know, came into our minds of being in some place like the, you know, the catacombs where you were enclosed, but I really loved the idea that it was like a slick place, you know, the marble and stuff, so on the outside it had nothing but, you know, kind of a, a clean look, but inside was going to be, you know, rotting cadavers. Then we also had a fascination with the psychic world, and in particular the notion of psychic vampirism. And we did some studying and had some interviews with Thelma Moss at UCLA and other people like that to get a background on that whole world of bioenergy and things. And we kind of took these two ideas and you know merged them. And um, that's kind of where the story came from. Then once we scripted it, we we really thought we were doing an R-rated movie. We thought the gore level and the pus and maggots and all this stuff uh, would definitely give us an R. And much to our shock, it was in the days of you know intense slasher movies, and the MPAA ended up giving us a PG, which we were kind of insulted. But the truth is, the where we got the money from was a Mormon company that needed a tax write-off, and they gave us the, you know like $800,000, this is what we, we, uh, we made the movie for. Um, but they just wanted to take out any, you know, profanity from it, and we really didn't have any sex in it. So there was really nothing that, you know, in the MPAA's mind that really made it a R-rated movie. So it opened maybe about a year later from the time we, we did it, maybe even more than a year, come to think of it, because we opened, uh, I think it was January, 1983 um, and we had a fairly wide release and it you know got kind of you know mixed uh, reviews mainly because you know if you were a horror fan it's sort of like this is kind of throwing a throwback to the old gothic horror films which of course you know where my passion was in the old universal horror movies and also the Hammer horror movies and the Roger Corman movies, um, which I was a major Vincent Price fan. So it had more of those elements than the, you know, kind of pedal to the metal, you know, slash, slice and dice approach. Uh, on the other hand, we also got reviews that compared us to Poltergeist because uh, that came out before us, even though we, you know, had gotten this movie shot and, and done, it just was one of those strange things where Stephen had, uh, you know, these floating corpses, you know, in the, in the pond, and that, you know, the, the kind of way we were using the corpses, you know, definitely showed a similarity, although just was happenstance in that regard. But yeah, we, it was, you know, a real labor of love for the amount of money that it was done for. And, uh, you know, I want to do a, a, a well, a kind of a re-envision of the film now, which is something I've been working on for years, uh, to give more of Raymar's backstory and do something a little different with the girls and also the effects, you know, that would happen here in the mausoleum. Raymar was played by a corpse. <laughs> Ray, Raymar actually, you know, you never actually see the real Raymar. Um, but I learned years later from um, actually Rob Berman, Tom Berman, who did the makeup effects, um, that the face of Raymar is actually Christopher Walken, that he had done a plaster of Walken when he was, you know, not famous yet. And they needed a face to sort of form Raymar's face for the corpse that you see in the movie. And it actually is Christopher Walken. If you take a close look, that you'll, you'll see it. But I never knew that till just a couple of years ago. As a filmmaker, after you pass 26, you already feel like you've failed because Orson Welles made Citizen Kane at 26. And we all sort of use that as like the, you know, God, you gotta make something before you're 26. So I was a little long in the tooth 
tooth at 31, I felt. But now, you know, it's like anything else, you know, things happen in the time they're supposed to happen. And since that time, I've been very, very fortunate to have made, I think at this point, it's like 42 films. And people go, where the hell are your 42 films? And it's like, well, cable and, you know, network. And I did a bunch of things for Lifetime. And kind of what changed in my life is I went from Stephen, a Stephen King movie, uh, a Freddy's Nightmare thing where I got to direct uh, Freddy. And of course, you know, my Friday the 13th, Jason Lives, bringing Jason back to life. And One Dark Night, my movies then in, in television were real monsters, you know, AIDS, global warming, you know, segregation, alcoholism, mental illness, you know, the real monsters of society. So a lot of the effects and things and feelings that I had from the 80s, you know, horror, you know, the straight ahead monster kind of movies sort of, you know, transcended into, you know, what in life we, we are, we're really scared of, you know, the, the person that looks so nice who's actually the serial killer you know I've touched upon a lot of that where you just can't trust you know anything um, and to me that's obviously the most scary thing claustrophobic darkness and a person that has another agenda the toothbrush is as I've said before it's a you know it came from a girl that was a friend of mine's uh, girlfriend and she felt it was like a kind of a like a security blanket or something like, like an oral fixation aspect I don't know it but you know she also said that you know it kept guys away from her if she was walking alone because they thought she was a little off and when we were writing the script and I was trying to find different sort of character quirks and things for these girls I thought the kitty character would be interesting if she had that toothbrush and at some point Carol says to her you know would you get that stupid toothbrush out of your mouth. Why do you have that? And she just says, I don't know, I just like the way it tastes, which is pretty much what the, you know, girl that I got the idea from said. Um, when the actress, Leslie Spates, you know, came to, to set that day and, you know, I, I handed her and she says, oh, you're serious about this? And I said, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is part of what this character is. And it's kind of like, when she gets nervous, out comes the toothbrush and she puts it in her mouth. And I said, I, I just love the fact that somebody actually did that. And she went, okay, cool. Yeah, One Dark Night was my first one. That led to Friday the 13th, part six, Jason Lives. Once I did those, I really wanted to do a romantic fantasy. Another thing I carried around for years, uh, Date with an Angel. And after Date with an Angel, uh, Dino De Laurentiis, who produced that, then had me do Stephen King's Sometimes They Come Back. And that was actually released in Europe as a like widescreen um, anamorphic film. But then it was sold here in the States as a CBS TV movie. And that's kind of what sort of took me into the realm of TV movies. And the first thing was In a Child's Name, which was a, you know, uh, Valerie Bertinelli, you know, uh, Michael Ron Keane, uh, Christopher Maloney, I mean, we had just an incredible cast, uh, Louise Fletcher, and I knew nothing about TV movies. I didn't want to be doing television, but I kind of took everything that I knew from horror and suspense and put it into that thing, and it was, a, I mean, much to my shock, honestly, it was a, you know, devastatingly unbelievable that it was the number one film that year, which was 1991, because I did a luminol sequence that ended the first night that basically was a splatter scene <laughs> with blood and, and you know, hand prints and stuff from this murder scene. But I did it in green with a fluorescent light on it so that it glowed green. So you saw the aftermath of this horrendous murder, but in a whole different way. And I guess that really freaked people out. And uh, when the second half of the miniseries aired, it went through the roof. I mean, it, it just, you know, beat Roseanne, beat all the big top shows, you know, as the number one uh, television program that, that particular week. So really changed my life um, in terms of going from making a movie once every three years to making three movies every year, which I was more interested in doing, you know, doing a life as a director, not as somebody that keeps directing projects and waiting for the money. You know, television had 
instant money, an instant place to put it, and it gave me a chance to make a lot of films. Many came out on DVD, a lot of them are somewhere out there, maybe get streamed one day when they do, you know, great old TV movies. The other big one was uh, Fire Next Time with Craig D. Nelson and Bonnie Bedelia and Richard Farnsworth. Um, and that, that we went over three states to do this sort of global warming piece, what happens to this country once global warming really, really hits. So we were a little ahead of our time with it, but it was again a kind of a message movie, but with a, you know, kind of a family falling apart and then coming back together through this uh, well, that was four hours as well, or six hours. It was, wow. it was a biggie. It, it almost was like early Hollywood, where people just needed product. Uh, television really was like a feeding machine. You know, you had ABC, CBS, and NBC. They all put out a Sunday night movie. They all needed, you know, people to, to make these films and make them on a fairly tight schedule. By today's standards, they're not as tight as like some low budget features. I mean, we started at kind of like 24 and then it went to 22 days, then to 18 days. And by the time I stopped doing them, they were at 16, 17 days. I literally would get a script on a Thursday and they would say, read it. If you like it, you're on a plane on Saturday to start prep on this. So the turnaround time was like nothing, and I could get a call almost any time, and it was almost like being a doctor on call. It's like, you know, we got a movie, you want to come? And if they had a, a star attached, I mean, one thing where I, for a year, I refused to do any TV movies, and then I got a call, and it's like, Marlon Brando wants to meet you. You know, are you still not interested in doing a TV movie? It was with Brando, and I went, Mm, let me meet Brando, you know, so that was a great thing to happen in your life, you know, spend three hours, you know, talking to Brando. Ultimately, he backed out of the project and I ended up with uh, Donald Sutherland, um, but that's what Brando did. He would say he was interested in something and then kind of get cold feet. I guess I'm glad on one level that Brando didn't do it because he would have been a real difficult customer to deal with from everything that people told me. He was going to get a million dollars a week, which is absurd for a TV movie, but, you know, the producer wanted him. But that was one of the few times there I said, yeah, I will, I will, I'll go ahead and do it. But as I said, it kind of switched on me. It wasn't Brando, it was Donald Sutherland, and it worked really well, and that kind of got me back into, you know, I could sit on my butt and keep waiting for a film, or I can keep, you know, doing these TV movies. But finally, they did send me a movie um, called The Unsaid with Andy Garcia, a feature film. And uh, I met with Andy and we liked each other immediately. So, you know, I was off making a feature film again, and uh, which was great because I could kind of do all the stuff that had been sitting inside of me, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, darker, edgier kinds of material. Um, and Universal picked it up. Then they got scared of it because it had an incest element to it and uh, you know it we did incredibly well in Europe uh, with the film I've had a lot of people call me and had seen it in theaters in Spain and France and Germany but here it ended up being released on DVD um, with commentary and all that stuff but it was always kind of frustrating to me because the reactions that we got at film festivals was phenomenal but uh, the dark nature of the film scared off Universal from doing it doing a theatrical release the other inspiration that came out of the movie was my final resting place. Want to see? This is uh, my final resting place, um, future home. Not for quite a while, uh, but I decided that I wanted to get everything ready and actually have some instructions here once I'm gone um, to be able to possibly communicate, and if any of you get a chance, you can see on YouTube, uh, Legends Never Die, Hollywood Forever, and I'll give a whole backstory about kind of how this all came about. But I've always been fascinated in the whole concept of what happens after you're gone, and less in a just ghost, you know, way, but more, more in like, as we do with films, you know, you create something and you, you leave it behind for future generations and hopefully for people to look at a period of time, you know, when you hopefully where you're most creative. 
Um, but then I thought, you know, could you also do things after you're gone? And that's kind of what this concept is. Uh, this is my, you know, modem, for lack of better terms. Uh, and I have no desire to actually get myself locked in here, but I do have this idea of the bioenergy and things that we talk about in One Dark Night resigning here or part of it in a positive way uh, for people hopefully to connect with. I know it sounds crazy, but so did cell phones and uh, internet and a lot of things, television and all the things that technology has finally shown us there's ways that we can harness stuff that's invisible you know into something and my feeling is what we have up here is far greater than a piece of plastic you know that can pick up uh, you know waves of, of, of energy and communication that you know was never believed never believed it was possible before so this is uh, this is kind of where uh, I'm hoping that you know a different type of uh, experience you know will, will happen.